Jay Rudeman, welcome to the Trapes and Global on Wheels podcast hour. Thank you. Jay Rudeman is the president of the Rudeman Family Foundation an advocacy organization focusing on the full inclusion of people with disabilities into society. Jay graduated from Brandeis University with honors and received his JD from Boston University School of Law. He lives in Boston with his wife, Shira, and their four children. To kick off, I know you, um, your, one of your former positions was a district attorney uh, position. And I'm curious, how did that position um, make you a better disability rights advocate when doing philanthropy work at the Ruder, Ruderman Family Foundation? Well, I, I think one thing as an assistant district attorney, you deal with hundreds of people every day from criminal defendants to criminal defense attorneys to prosecutors to uh, court clerks to um, judges. And I think that doing that job for years and interacting with hundreds of people, you get a really good sense very quickly as to who the person is. So I, I think that that is what helped me the most. Um, one, being able to triage and decide what's important, what's not important, and also being able to read people. And I think that's come in really handy because I think in, in the world of, of philanthropy, anytime I've run into an issue, it's had to do with ego. So, you know, I'm at a point now in life where I really want to work with people who I like and who I trust. And um, I think I have a good sense of that. Mm -hmm. So what can the disability rights movement in Israel um, learn from the movement here in the United States states, and vice versa. I think you have a unique perspective here right. and can really shed some light in that area. Right. So I I, I'm an American, uh, you know, born and brought up in, in Boston, but, you know, lived nine years in Israel and started to raise my family in Israel, although I live back in Boston right now. And our foundation is based in Boston uh, but we do an have an office in Israel. Um, listen, disability rights issues tend to be the same all over the world. It just depends on how the government reacts to to um, the, the the push for expanded disability rights. So in Israel, I would say their laws may be a little bit more advanced. They um, have signed on to the UN uh, Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities, whereas the United States has not. Um, so the laws in Israel are very good, but the implementation is not that good. And that's a cultural thing. You, you may have you know, a law saying you need to have curb cuts in, in, in sidewalks that are being built, but then you might have a developer who develops a neighborhood and doesn't put in curb cuts. Um, I think in the United States, maybe there's more adherence to the law. Um, but, you know, sometimes I find that the issues that people with disabilities face are universal. Uh, the stigma is universal. I think that um, unemployment of people with disabilities is very high in Israel. Uh, it's very high in the United States. Um, there, there, there are very, very similar issues. I think one thing that the United States can learn from Israel is the, um, you know, most Israelis serve in the military in Israel. And um, if you don't serve in, in the military, it's seen as, as, as um, you're not fully part of society. So one thing that, that the Israeli army has done with many different nonprofit groups is they've taken young people with disabilities and they've allowed them to have an army service and they've allowed them to use their skills um, that are particular to them to help the army. Like for example, um, there's a group of young people with autism who um, they're in, in a particular unit, their, their job is to track um, uh, equipment, you know, whether it be uh, cars or Jeeps or planes or whatever. And, and, and the focus that that takes is 
so great that most people wouldn't have the patience to put that much focus in. But some people in the autism community really excel at that. And, and the Israeli army has been able to take that sort of skill set and, and use it for the benefit of, of the army. Whereas in this country, I don't think you're going to find people with disabilities in, in the U.S. Army. And it's a shame because I think everyone has the ability to contribute. Mm -hmm. And I think you are doing an amazing job of exposing yourself to people with disabilities as well. Um, the case being today, right now, um, being willing to come on the podcast show. Um, as you may know, I use a manual wheelchair diagnosed with polio when I was younger and scoliosis. And so I use a manual wheelchair to get around. And with the next question, I know you're already walking the walk, but just further elaborate. So if one does not elaborate for other able-bodied people who do not have the lived experience of a person with a disability. So if one does not have the lived experience of someone with a disability, how do you ensure that they are upholding nothing about us without us mm -hmm. and providing support and services that are truly relevant and useful to the disability community? Because I'm sure uh, another, another factor that you're aware of is, you know, people with disabilities will say things, exact things that you say, um, representation in performing arts. These are things that the disability community have been calling for um, right. and which you are also calling for. And I appreciate that, but people listen to you more and they will listen as a white Caucasian man they will listen to you more. And so how do you use that power and harness it and direct that light towards somebody who has that lived experience? So first of all, I mean, I, we've been doing this for 20 years and, and, I, and I think that, you know, it's important to understand the role of a foundation. A foundation, you know, has a certain mission. Our mission has always been um, focus on disability rights, focus on disability inclusion, you know, we've taken a path that's lead us, that's led us to more advocacy, that's led us into the entertainment world. Um, one of the things that a foundation has is the foundation has the resources uh, to put towards uh, something. But I I've I've always been aware and internalized um, the saying nothing about us without us. So. You know, we've always tried in terms of our, our staffing, in terms of our events, um, to always include allies, you know, with disabilities. So, and the other thing that I would say is that none of us know everyone that has a disability because there are hidden disabilities that you may not see, but, you know, people may have them. So I think that people have to be very careful in saying, well, this person doesn't have a disability. It may not be a visible disability, but they may have a disability. But, you know, for example, like in our work in Hollywood, whenever we've done something public, I've always called on um, allies in the industry um, who have disabilities, someone like Danny Woodburn or Marley Matlin uh, um, and dozens of others and included them. And in fact, you know, there've been times where I've been like, I don't want to get up on the stage or I won't get up on the stage by myself because I really need someone with a visible disability up there to make the point. Um, so like, for example, when we've partnered with um, Variety Magazine on their inclusion conference or uh, the Sundance Film Festival or the Academy Awards, we've always worked with allies in the disability community to put them front and center. Um, and I would say, I don't, I don't think particularly it's, you know, being white and, and, and male, I think it's the fact that you represent money that may open some doors. And, and so, you know, one of the things that I came, you know, my background as, as a lawyer and my background as a, a civil rights activist, you know, I've always gravitated towards the rights aspect of disability rather than the segregation aspect of disability, which a lot of funders tend to, to fund, you know, separate schools, separate housing, um, um, sheltered workshops. We've always gone away from that into more, um, policies that, that, that foster inclusion. But 
a while ago, I said, listen, you know, we can advocate and we can come out. And one of the advantages that we have is that we speak very quickly and very forcefully and we have a track record. So it gets a lot of coverage. Um, but, you know, we formed a group years ago called Link 20, which are young activists with and without disabilities who advocate on behalf of disability rights. And we put a lot of resources into training them to become better activists. And they've had tremendous success, like to get Major League Baseball to change um, the term, the disabled list into the injured list, or to have the um, US Olympic Committee say that Paralympians and, and, and Olympians will, will receive parity in metal pay. Uh, which is something that they didn't have before. And, and our work with airlines and, and um, you know, we just had a success in Israel with, with our Link 20 group there in terms of changing or getting more money to accommodate people with disabilities in, in the bus system. So um, I think that this is the future and this is why, you know, we really put a lot of work into um, helping people with disabilities become better advocates. Um, and, and I think for whatever success that we've had, you know, I've used whatever skills that I've had um, to be able to move things forward. Um, but, you know, we're not alone. And, and I've never wanted to, you know, act like we're alone. We have, we have allies and we tend to, you know, work with the allies. And a lot of times working with the allies is not just giving them a place and giving them a role, but also paying them for their services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, thank you for, for that. I think you made some really great points. And we need, we need allies like you and your foundation. You're right. It's not just about being Caucasian and being a man, although there is such that those factors do not hurt. Money is, is a major, major contributor as well. I agree. In your opinion, what are the, uh, the, the most uh, severe issues facing people with disabilities, the disability community in the next 10 years? And, and what are your thoughts um, with uh, your foundation, the Ruderman Family Foundation in helping tackling these issues? So I would say that the, the, the number one issue is the stigma that, that people with disabilities face in society you still haven't budged the numbers in terms of employment and employment, you know, before COVID unemployment in the United States was like below 5%. And, but people with disabilities routinely are over 70%. Um, and a lot of that comes from stigma. I mean, there are other issues regarding transportation, but, you know, companies, you know, it depends on what company and the companies that have been better at including people with disabilities have always been companies where they have a personal connection to disability, someone in their family, like you mentioned, Tom Harkin, who had a brother who was deaf, every major corporation that's doing something great on disability has someone in their family with a disability. And that's why it's important to them. But how do you get beyond that? To get beyond the stigma and say, listen, people with disabilities are part of society just like anyone else and deserve, you know, a fair shot. That's the challenge right now. And it's one of the reasons why we've really focused on the entertainment industry, because I think that popular entertainment influences people's attitudes and will have far reaching ramifications on the inclusion of people with disabilities in almost any legislation that's out there. And so, you know, with, with um, entertainment, I mean, we got into it because we've been involved in advocacy of, of really being critical and, and really criticizing movies and television shows that have inauthentically portrayed disability. Um, and we were pushing a big boulder up the hill in, in, in the entertainment industry because whereas you'll no longer see, let's say, a Caucasian uh, actor play an African-American actor or an Asian actor or a Native American actor or a Hispanic actor 
um, or even in the LBGTQ, that's also you know changing, where you're seeing more and more authentic representation. With disability, you're still stuck in the in the mindset in Hollywood that playing a disability is great acting. And in fact, in the last 30 years, uh, half of the men that have won the best actor Oscar have, have won it for playing a disability. So we start to be super critical. We got a lot of attention in the media. And then we start to get the attention of the studios and we start to sit down with the studios. Um, and one by one, you know, so far we've gotten CBS Viacom, we've gotten NBC Universal to agree to open their all of their auditions to actors with disabilities. And I think what you will see is a pipeline where you'll see more and more accurate representation of disability in film and, and TV. And I think there's another couple of studios that will come along with what we're what we're proposing. Um, the Academy Awards is talking about the best, pack, uh, best um, the Oscar for best picture and how disability will be one of the categories that they're gonna look at in terms of diversity. So there is change in Hollywood and this change in Hollywood will change our society. I mean, Michelle Obama once said that most of us get to know people who are not like us because we see them on television. And I think you're gonna see, you're gonna see more and more authentic uh, portrayal of disability on television, in movies, in theater, and it will change public perception of disability. Yeah, I agree with you. I think in the performing arts, whether that be Hollywood or, you know, now on these streaming platforms, Netflix, Hulu, um, whatnot, um, you know, we are all as a society globally uh, on our screens, living our lives lives virtually more and more. And so it becomes all that more important that what we're looking at is uh, representative of our actual society. 20% of the globe or 1 billion people in the world having all sorts of different disabilities and living all sorts of different kinds of vibrant lives. I think when it comes to stigma, I agree with you that stigma is a major challenge and 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 the problem the reason why it's a major challenge is people see a person um, perhaps with a physical limitation or some sort of other obvious thing that they perceive as limitation and they can't see beyond what is possible and right. so just providing that providing that avenue and providing those options and, and really forcing people to be like, look, this is what different types of humans with different types of skills can do right. and expand that mindset. Right. I think that's right. I think the other thing that, that I should mention is, you know, you mentioned the, the numbers, 20% of the population, you know, billions of, of, of people, millions of people around, around the world have a disability. And we've done market research that show, shows the buying power of people with disabilities and their families and the desire to see more authentic representation. Um, the, 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 the lack of diversity when it comes to disability in television and, and how the progress has been minimal. Um, so you know, the other thing that the disability community, you know, and I've, I've written about this and I, and I truly believe this, if the disability community was a united community, they would be the most powerful political community in the United States and probably the world. The problem is dis people with disabilities do not always see themselves as a part of an entire community. And so you'll see groups that will fundraise and organize because they're part of the blind community or the deaf community or the Down syndrome community or the autism community or um, you know, cerebral palsy community or whatever, or, or veterans of, of um, you know, wounded warriors. But you know, in reality, many people in the disability community face the same barriers. So, um, I think the more united the disability community um, will be 
And the more that leaders emerge that say, we have a lot in common and we should work together, the more powerful the movement will become. Right now, I don't see many significant national or international leaders that are pulling many, many, many different people with disabilities into the same movement. But I think that that is the key to success. Um, and I think that that's, you know, the, the, the way, you know, things should go forward. I, I think also, you know, there's a role for criticism. And, you know, we certainly as a foundation have been very critical um, of movies and, and television shows, you know, critical to the point where we've had major um, newspapers run editorials against us. And we've been able to, you know, put ourselves out front there and say, okay, we'll take the heat for this, but this is the right thing to say. Um, but we don't have to be the only ones to say that. Um, and I think also, you know, social media can be a force for good, but it can be a force for evil. And when it can be a force for good, it's getting like-minded people banded together around a cause. When it's a force for evil, it can be, I'm so mad, I'm going to fight you because you said the wrong word and 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 then you see, you have you see a lot of fighting within within the same community um and people throwing around the term of you know ableist which is a very very strong um statement it's like calling someone a racist and you know most people are not trying to be ableists they may not know they may make a mistake but there's a tendency in social media to jump all over people. And uh, some people at that point will raise up their hands and say, that's it, I'm out of here. You know, I'm not involved anymore. And, and so I think that, you know, instead of being angry, um, you know, I once learned in my political background, you have friends and potential friends. And I'm not saying you don't stand up for what you believe in, but you have to, if you go back to the civil rights movement of the early 60s, and you look at someone like you know Martin Luther King or John Lewis, they had many, many allies that were not African Americans. And they, you know, they marched with many different people because they knew they had to have allies. I I think it's a mistake when the disability community will lash out at people and not build those allies because they need them. I agree with you. And, and why do you think it has been a particular challenge for the disability community to, to form? It, it's hard for all groups, all civil rights groups to, to form cohesive groups and, and create lasting change. But it seems to be a particular case for the disability uh, rights movement. And how, so, so so why is that? And then how can we create these, um, these big, powerful, co cohesive communities that I think you've mentioned before? First of all, I think you need the right leader. And it doesn't need to be one leader, it can be many leaders. I mean, look in the early 60s in the, in the civil rights movement and the African American community, there were many, many leaders that, that, that came out and they all had their own you know, power bases but they were trying to build movements. I, I just see a lot of people tearing each other down, you know, and I've heard on many occasions from different people saying, I'm the answer. I'm the, I'm, I'm the savior. I'm the person, you know, people just have to follow me. Well, that's not the way it works. You have to really reach out and try to build allies. And that that's hard work. It takes a lot of hard work. And sometimes it means putting your ego aside. Um, but I do think social media sometimes works against the community. And the other thing is like, you know, we do a lot of work with journalists. I mean, you know, a racial attack in the United States, because our, our entire history in the United States is based on race. It's based on taking an entire people from Africa and subjugating them and making them slaves. And then after the Civil War and after slavery, you know, when, when, when the slaves were freed, the Jim Crow laws and sub subjugating, you know, an entire population, and even to this day, you know, racism is the number one um, 
undercurrent in this country. Um, you know, people with disabilities are still facing a misunderstanding of where they are. This, I, I, my guess is that if you ask most people, they're going to say, "Oh, people with disabilities, they are, um, they need our help. They need charity. They need, they need um, support." Um, not necessarily like, "Oh, they deserve equal rights." And and I think that that comes from hard work of making allies and explaining the case without attacking people, without you know, just saying, listen, we need your help and, and this is our movement and this is how we're moving forward. And it means, you know, different groups coming together, you know, um, people that are deaf and people that are blind and all different, you know, groups and saying, you know, let's form a coalition and come together. And, and there needs to be more of that happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's definitely, it is a big task, uh, not, done by one person or a group of people, lots of people for sure. You know, when we meet with the studios and some of these studios, they come along right away. And some of them, it takes years and years and years of trying to educate them. And they're afraid and they're, they're and you know, they have, you know, legal issues to deal with and so forth. Um, but, you know, like for example, um, if I'm meeting with, 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 with the studio, and, and we're saying, okay, you know, we have a lot of media coverage and we have the ability to speak out and we know people in, in, in journalism and, you know, we think this is the right thing to do and we've made the right connections. You know, if you had 5,000 people show up in the street outside with people with disabilities outside of a studio, my God, they would change the policy right away. You know, it, it's just, um, you just never see that in the, in the disability community. And you see a tremendous amount of fighting within the community, um, and and that's not that's not productive. That's not productive. There needs to be more cohesion, more working together. Um, the numbers are there. The numbers are there to, to to influence any political election. But if you see how many campaigns talk about disability very, very few, because they don't sense the community. They don't sense the political power of the community. Yeah, I think what's, in my opinion, what would be more realistic today would be, you know, half a million people um, joining in on a, a hashtag or something and tweeting about something rather than showing up in person, because with that, um, there are barriers. I, I right. don't know any city in the United States that have uh, a public transportation system that is 100% accessible. Right. That's good. And, and that includes Washington DC, which I, in my opinion, has the best public transportation system right. in the United States. And so- It's a good, it's a good point. I mean, I, I think that, you know, if you could gather together and you had a, you had a call for action you know, we're going to boycott this company until they change the policy. Believe me, every single company is paying attention on the social media. And, and if enough people are starting to line up against them, they will pay attention. They mm -hmm. may not answer right away, but they, they know what's going on. I mean, when we've gone after injustices by companies, it could be an airline, it could be, you know, um, a major um, uh, retail outlet or whatever, they're paying attention. They usually respond very quickly. They understand the, the, the problems that they're making. And, and I think that, yeah, the numbers online will make a difference, but there has to be a coordination. You know, I hear from companies where it's like, okay, if there's an issue and you've made it clear and you reached out and you said, we want to work with you, things get done. Um, when they're attacked and there's no solution and they're just constantly attacked, then they don't understand what they can do to make things better. You have to, you have to have, a, you have to have a solution. You have to have an end game. You have to have a way to move forward. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, with, with all of that being said, I th think one of the major takeaways is, you know, physical presence, um, Physical presence is important, but 
given how given the direction of our society and also the current pandemic virtual presence a cohesive presence i would argue is even more important and right. that is is more accessible as well for a lot of people with different types of disabilities um, especially with how um, the different technologies that have been made more accessible screen readers right. um, other types of other types of specialized technology that uh, people use these days to accommodate um, so I want to bring up something that you mentioned in a previous interview but also here as well a little bit earlier you were saying that you know disability issues are a lot of times seen as charity issues and not as uh, civil rights issues. Uh, what, what do you think, what, why do you think that is? Uh, what was the catalyst for that? And then how do we shift it into uh, the issue that it's supposed to be, civil rights issue? I think it's because of the historical nature of how society dealt with disabilities. I mean, you know, how many years ago were people with disabilities institutionalized? And that was considered the, the appropriate way to deal with people with disabilities. And then when institutionalization was, was seen as barbaric, uh, what happened after that? Well, we're gonna help this community by segregating them. We're gonna put them in, in um, you know, group homes. We're gonna put them in sheltered workshops. Uh, we're gonna put them in special schools that are not integrated schools. And I think that that was sort of the attitude. Like, you know, people have, you know, issues and they're not part of, you know, quote unquote, normal um, society. But, you know, now we, we know that there is no normal society. Everyone is different. Everyone has, has something a little bit different. And by the way, we're, we're now living in a time where differences are, are celebrated. I mean, if you look at um, fashion, you see more people with disabilities in fashion. If you see, you know, television, movies, you know, it's not happening so quickly, but you are seeing more and more people with disabilities. I, I know because I know the statistics and I know, I know friends of mine who are actors who are getting, you know, more jobs. Um, is it where it needs to be? No, we have a long, long way to go. Um, but I, I think that, that making your voice heard and making it heard not alone or with a dozen people, but making it heard with hundreds of people will change. And, and, and I think that more organization, more um, building a significant um, presence, you know, will get the attention of the people you want to get whose attention you want to get and things will change. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know we often mention, you know, um, uh, amazing uh, individuals with disabilities from the past, uh, Beethoven, Stephen Hawking, Hel Helen Keller, you know, those names are mentioned all the time as uh, exemplary examples. W who are the equivalents of today in, in today's society right now in 2021? Well, there's so many people. I mean, you know, you have like Richard Bernstein, who is a member of the Michigan Supreme Court, uh, who was just elected, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, you have some amazing actors out there who you know, some of them are older and some of them are younger, but, uh, you know, they are working. Um, they may not be household names and famous yet, but they may be someday. Um, you know, there's so many, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of, of you know, people with disabilities that are acting. There are people in fashion. There are people in, in, in business. Um, I, I think that, you know, there are so many people out there and, and, and not to mention the fact that, you know, many, many celebrities, you know, are, are very um, speaking very outwardly about their own disability, you know, mental health, anxiety, depression, 
um, you know, it's coming to a four people are, you know, that, that would never have happened in the past. And I see that happening, you know, all the time with major sports figures from, you know, Michael Phelps to, you know, Kevin Love in basketball, um, you know, celebrities like um, Demi Lovato or, or um, um, Selena Gomez and, and, and so many people are, are, are speaking about this. And I think mental health is now, especially because of COVID, no longer a stigma, um, at least in certain societies. You know, some societies they are. And if you're talking about a macho field like uh, law enforcement, you still have an, more people die by suicide than, than die in the line of duty. That has to stop. People have to be more comfortable about speaking about their own mental health issues. Um, but I think there's more and more people out there, man. I remember watching the Super Bowl um, and a young Paralympian, uh, Jessica Long, did a half an hour commercial for Toyota. Um, I mean, I know that there's some question, you know, some people say, well, you know, it was like disability porn and, and, and you know, inspirational porn. But on the other hand, I mean, I, I know who Jessica is and I've, you know, interviewed her for my podcast and hey, half an hour during the Super Bowl, you know, showing her life, not bad, exposes a lot of people to who she is. Um, and it regularizes, it, it, it makes disability more of a regular thing. You know, she's a great swimmer. She's, she's, she's a, a Paralympian. Um, she just has to have, happens to have a disability. I think, you know, the important part is not only uh, not only sharing about, you know, her story, people knowing about her story, um, but the uniqueness of it and, and the ability then expanding people's minds of right. how people who you don't normally see in mainstream media um, can also have a vibrant and uh, happy life right. from this different vantage point that you've never seen before. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that you make a good point. It's like disability is part of the human condition. It's not like, um, you know, you see all these times, you know, this uh, a child has a disease and he's very sick and he's very, you know, has, has a disability and, you know, people are raising money because they feel bad for him. That's not what you want. You want people to say, okay, you know, you are a person that has a disability, you're part of society, you have the right to access any part of society that you want. And you shouldn't be looked at as charity. You should be looked at as a human being who is part of our society. Mm -hmm, exactly. I agree with you that stigma and changing attitude is very important. Um, but just like with a company, you first have to you know, create the company and then you have to maintain the company because now you have all the staff mm -hmm. and that is counting on the livelihood is dependent on that income. But right. then you got to grow it and, and move it forward and make sure it keeps growing and making, you know, whatever the, the solution, uh, whatever the issue you're trying to solve is making right. and making the world a better place. And so I think that's what attitude is, right? Attitude and stigma is, uh, is pushing people's expanding people's minds and 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 growing them and and helping them see what's possible but what's in the middle and what's in the beginning because we i feel like there needs to be three different paths if we keep waiting for people's minds to expand it's yes you will see progress here and there but it's it's much too slow yeah i mean i think everyone has a different role that they play you know our role has always been trying to work from the top down but people need to work from the bottom up and that's part of like what we've done with link 20 is to get you know groups of activists with and without disabilities to become um better advocates and and you know advocacy is speak is at least as i see it is is speaking out strong but also with a sense of respect and, 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 and speaking to people 
you know, through their hearts and minds. Um, and not based on charity and not based on completely attacking them. I mean, there's a science to it. And, and I, 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 I wish there was, I mean, I've been working for, for a couple of decades and, and I know some leaders in the field, but there's no one I can point to and say he or she is the next Martin Luther King of the disability rights movement. It just doesn't exist. And, and um, as soon as it's about you, it's not going to be successful. If it's about you're, you're, you're a catalyst within a movement and you want other people to join you, then it's successful. And I don't see enough of that happening. Mm -hmm. And with um, you, so you've mentioned these attacks several times now and the lack of cohesiveness and, 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 and the confusion with the, you know, the example you just gave earlier, one person coming to Congress for this, another person coming to Congress for that. But the thing is the direction's kind of different, especially right. if they also don't have the issue sorted and are fully informed themselves to, to come up with a plan that is nuanced and works in multiple different ways. Right. And so what, what attacks should be stopped what, what, what are the major issues that are in, 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 the, in the cyber world right now and that, that people should confront and um, in order for them to know how to move out of that cyclical cycle? People should confront any injustice that they see and they should do it in a coordinated fashion, um, but they shouldn't spend their time attacking each other in the same community because tearing down each other is not going to help at all. It's just going to confuse outsiders. It's going to confuse yourself. Can you give some personal examples? Because I sense that you've, you've brought this up numerous times now over the course of the interview. Have you, have you been personally attacked for the work that you've done? And how does that negatively affect the work that you do? Because it is you know, you have the best in, of intentions of trying to progress a movement that mm -hmm. is very hard to progress. Right. So I remember one example where, I mean, one of the things that you have to do is you have to try to speak to the hearts and minds and the sense of justice of the general society. And, and, you're, and you're dealing with a society that doesn't quite get it. You know, it's, you're making a leap. You know, they don't quite get it. Um, you know, why people with disabilities, you know, should be fully integrated because that's not the world they grew up in. Um, it, it may be for younger people, that's the world they grew up in. Older people did not grow, grow up in that world. So I remember like one tweet I put out and <clears throat> my objective was to try to make disability universal, like to, to, to explain to people that it impacts so many people. So I, I said, um, disability is the one minority group that all of us will one day join. Now, the mistake that I made in that tweet was instead of saying, it's the one minority group that one of us will all, that all of us will one day join. I should have said it's the um, one minority group that most of us will one day join. Because the longer we live, the more of us will develop a disability and become part of the disability community. But what I got attacked by dozens of people is, you know, saying you're an ableist and you're, you know, what were they mad about? not everyone will become disabled because someone could walk across the street, get hit by a car and, and die, and they don't become part of the disability community. Or, you know, they could have a heart attack and die and they're not part of the disability community. So it's not everyone, it's most people. And, and, and that one word from all to most would have completely changed it. But instead of like giving a break and sort of saying, okay, 
it was a misphrase. It was one word that was wrong. It was attack, 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 attack. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about an organization that, you know, where I've dedicated my life to this issue of disability rights. And we've put, you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars behind this issue. So that's the person you want to attack. I mean, it's just, it's, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it, and, and, that, and that, and part of that is social media. Part of that is social media, like attack, 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 attack everyone. Uh, it's just not, you know, a pleasant world to be in, you know? Um, and so how does that neg negatively affect not only your work, but the overall movement and that the funding that, that you give as well? It, I mean, it makes, it makes people feel like, why, you, why am I doing this? You know, why am I doing this? You know, like what, you know, maybe I should have a more like peaceful, less, less confrontational life. Um, you know, and, 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 um, you know, I've learned since then, I've learned, you know, sort of techniques that when people are just, you know, negative or like if people swear at me, I just block them. I, you know, it's like, okay, there's so many people out in the world out there. I just don't need your negativity. You know, that's not going to do any good. Um, and like I said, it's about friends and potential friends. You know, people that say, okay, I get, I get what you're saying. And, you know, I want to follow you. I want to, you know, know what you guys are doing. But people that just want to attack you, there's no benefit to be involved with those people. So um, there's a lot of angry people out there and I understand why people are angry um, for you know, many different reasons, but I just don't think that that's a way you know, to go forward. If you're gonna walk into a member of Congress's office and speak to them, if you're immediately gonna you know, jump all over them and attack them and saying you're an ableist and you're the part, part of the problem and, and so forth and so on, you're gonna lose that member of Congress. Whereas if you walk in and you say, okay, you know, and you realize during the meeting, the congressperson doesn't understand the issue, let me educate you. Can I send you a letter? Can I send you some information? Can we have a follow-up meeting? Can I get a group of people together? Can I, in your district, can I get a group of people together that, you know, um, you can speak to and maybe they'll, they'll end up, you know, being your supporters. There, there's, there's better ways to go about it. Um, and I wish this was a lesson that the disability community would learn um, because there's a lot of anger and I understand the anger, but the anger doesn't necessarily lead to results. Um, you know, for example, you know, my work in the studios that we've gotten studios to change their policy. If I completely attack the studio all the time, they would close the door on me. They would say, you know, we, we, we don't need to work with you. You're a negative, you know, force. But if I say to them, listen, there's a benefit to this. 20% of the population is being excluded. You're not doing a good enough job, but you can do a good job. And by the way, if you do commit to, you know, changing your policy, you're going to get a tremendous amount of good media. And I'm going to work to, I'm going to make sure you get that media. It's a completely different conversation. Um, and again, I go back to like Martin Luther King. I, I don't think Martin Luther King was turning people away. Someone said, I want to, I want to march with you. I mean, he had, you know, white people, he had clergy, he had reverends, he had rabbis, he had people, <clears throat> you know, marching hand in hand. It was about building coalitions of the like-minded. Yeah, I agree with you. So not everyone like not, not even myself who has a disability, I just because I use a manual wheelchair, I'm not gonna be able to advocate for someone who's deaf or who has autism in the way that they want to be represented despite how good my intentions would be. And, right. and I think that's the same case with you being an able-bodied person who has no experience with disability, but you recognize that there's a big issue there. There is huge exclusion, discrimination, stigma going on, and you want to tackle that. 
you know, with the best of intentions. But at the same but, time, but I, but I wouldn't say that I have no experience with disability. First of all, I've been working in the field for 20 years and I've always surrounded myself with advisors. I have an advisory, you know, council. I have staff members. I have, you know, friends and allies. I, I've always included people with disabilities in everything, you know, that we do. And the other thing is how does someone know by looking at me that I don't have a disability? How do they know? Well, I know because you've said it multiple times in your interviews. What? That you don't have a disability. I don't think I ever said I don't have a disability. I, I say I don't identify, you know, that way because I, I think, you know, I'm sensitive to, um, you know, people with defined disabilities that, you know, they... I think there needs to, sorry to interrupt you, um, Jay, but I think there needs to be a defining point. I think that is also not a major issue, but a minor issue is when there needs to be a clear con conceptual understanding. Um, otherwise oh. there will be confusion as well. I mean, there's already enough confusion caused by other things that we've mentioned previously, but this, with the expansion of the word disability and the, the increasing number of um, increasing number of variety of people included in it also affects the cohesiveness as well. Well, you know, the other thing is that we as an organization have never defined disability. I look at disability as like how the Americans with Disabilities Act defines it. You know, if, if you have a condition that needs an accommodation that is seen as a disability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do I, do I need it? You know, I've, I've dealt with issues of, you know, depression, anxiety, um, you know, grew up with scoliosis. Do I define myself as a person with disability? I haven't, but do I have certain disabilities? Yes, I do. And I think most people do. I see. I see. I guess I was thinking of it from a point of view of, you know, if if you're if you're a, a black person, then you have a percentage of of that identity, whether if it's, you know, Barack Obama half or someone else who's, you know, two fifth, um, it, it, it it's easier to define. Right. Um, it's also, easier to yeah, yeah. Also, same with LGBTQ um, and and male, female, gender mm -hmm. things as well. Last question. This has been such a uh, rich conversation. I've learned a lot, and and uh, I'm sure that you're quite tired as well. As it's, since this is such a complex issue and we've delved into multiple different aspects. So I want to end on a, uh, uh, a more hopeful, positive note. Um, what progress have you seen with the disability uh, rights movement, either you know, here in the US domestically or internationally? You know, Cause I, I know you've lived in Israel and you have experiences there as well that you know, makes you hopeful and feel optimistic for the future, um, specifically regarding, you know, the work that you do with uh, disability advocacy, disability rights. I think that people with disabilities are becoming more visible and more vocal. And the combination of those two things, if you could combine it with more numbers, um, I see a great future for people with disabilities. In, in our own experience, when we've reached out to major, major industries and major, you know, like sports and entertainment, when we've said to them, listen, you're leaving disability out of diversity, some of them come back within a few days saying, you're right, we're changing it. You know, and others take a little bit more work, but it's happening. It's, it's not going to happen overnight. It won't happen within a year or two, but you know, let's talk five, 10 years down the road. I think our world is going to look very different. Mm -hmm. And so just a smaller follow-up from that. What, what, what is some personal tangible examples that keeps you going um, on this issue? 
the fact that we've been able to convince NBC Universal, CBS Viacom, the fact that we have two more studios that are on the verge of, you know, coming on to agree to audition actors with disabilities for all their roles. Um, the fact that we have major partnerships in the entertainment industry and, and not just the entertainment industry, but I think the entertainment industry is the most impactful industry in changing public opinion. The fact that that's all coming together within a very short period of time makes me hopeful that society is going to change pretty soon. I think that is a great note to end on. Thank you so much for your amazing work. Hopefully, you know, our group effort will help make some lasting progress. I agree. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.